Welcome to the Live Cost Construction Experience Podcast. I'm Kieran Brennan, co founder of LiveCost.com. Finally, the construction sector has entered its digital transformation, meaning the way we operate our projects and businesses day to day is being disrupted. This podcast is designed to help you in all areas of your business. We do this by bringing in experts across all key areas of a construction business who share their stories, their challenges, wins, and losses so others can learn from their experiences. To watch previous episodes, please visit livecost.com or search livecost.com across all popular social platforms. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Live Cost Construction Experience. Delighted this week to be joined by the Associate Director of Town Moor, Mark Cronin. Mark, how are you? I'm great, thanks. Enjoying the good weather and uh, thanks for inviting me on. No problem at all. I, mean, I, I, I do want to get into the COVID situation and how you're dealing with it personally and how the company you're dealing with but I suppose to give sure. our listener base a bit of context can you tell us a bit about Townmore and sort of what your role is in there in a the day-to-day? Sure yeah uh, I suppose Townmore a kind of multifaceted organization uh, we're headquartered down in Tullamore in the Midlands uh, with offices up in Santry in Dublin and Mallow in Cork and London as well so we're working I suppose across Ireland uh, and throughout London and uh, our work is very mixed. I mean, it's everything from residential to healthcare. A uh, more recent addition to it would have been specialised stuff such as control environments, uh, medical device, uh, biotech, and so on. So it's a it's a wide and varied company. Probably you know group turnover circa eighty million and, and onwards of a hundred staff. So it's a a good sized company for a company that was only established in 20, uh, 20, 2008, rather I should say. We're only 12 years on the go, but uh, we've grown substantially uh, and successfully throughout the recession, and we're, we're in, uh, I suppose, a good stead at the moment and, and continue to grow year on year. That's pretty impressive, actually, for, for, that, for that, that length of time. Um, mm. I mean, I suppose it, you, we can't even get into conversation without being stuck in, in the COVID conversation. Yeah. I mean, I did come across an article with an interview yourself, sort of, I think it was mid April in the Irish Times. And you are basically making the point that these sites, in, in terms of social housing and medical voices, they need to, to reopen. Uh, yeah. I mean, how do you think the government has reacted to that situation? What, what, what was it the right thing to do? I think, uh, yeah, it was. They, they had to put a stop to it and uh, regroup, I suppose. Um, I think from a, from a healthcare point of view or public healthcare point of view, I think they've done a good job in, in, in the instance of COVID. I suppose the scary part is uh, the rest of... The healthcare requirements of the, the general public seem to have fallen away quite a bit and you know we it's not that COVID came in and all other illnesses suddenly stopped but people stopped going uh, for checkups for appointments and that that's worrying and i know yeah. they've been beat the drum in recent uh, weeks to try and get people to go back in but that is concerning because you know uh you can't trade one off for the other economically um look it's great we're back i suppose uh construction's one of the first ones back and we're pleased with that um, one thing that was concerning me, I suppose, when I did that article at the Times, I couldn't see a roadmap. Um, so the discussion all day, every day, across all news channels was COVID, as it should have been. It was topical, but there was no sense of hope or roadmap. How are we going to get out of this? And I think that was kind of, it wasn't just irking me. I think everyone is kind of getting a bit concerned, um, particularly SMEs. You know, how are we going to get through this? What's the, what's the end goal? How do we get past it? Um, so I think the fact that we have a roadmap now gives something for people to work towards. Yeah. Uh, gives a bit of hope. Everyone needs a bit of hope, um, and 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 that does assist it. And I know, like, if you've got a, a particular timetable of when your business is getting back, you're finally working towards. It's no different to look a tender or whatever. If you've got a deadline or something to work towards, you will do so. If you don't know what the hell is going to happen, is it three months, six months, twelve months? Uh, you know, it's a bit despairing, I think, for a lot of people. So look, thankfully. They brought out the roadmap and uh, people can see what they can work towards now. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a big, you can, I, I felt it this week, even we're only, only starting and I felt a lift in positivity. I mean, we're embedded yeah. in, in, in this industry and it, it has been good. I mean, what's new then? What's, what's new on site for you guys in terms of PPE and how, how are you managing that? Yeah, well, like I suppose we have spent the last six to eight weeks since uh, things shut down, uh, working vigorously in the background to try and come up with plans. I suppose the CIF have stepped up to the mark quite well on this occasion, yeah. uh, in terms of uh, SOPs and how to get back to work. And, you know, they've lobbied the government hard as well to advise that as an industry, um, it is fair to say, and I said in the article too, we are used to protocols uh, in construction. You don't just 
turn up in your casual gear and walk away on site the way you go. Uh, everything is uh, systematic, organized as protocols across the board. So we typically operate a, a five point PPE on site uh, across the country anyway. So that would be, you know, your, your standard uh, hard hat goggles, uh, your vest, your boots and so on, but uh, and gloves. Uh, we have introduced masks where required. Um, so it depends on, look, if you have a block there working on his Todd down the end of the site in the fresh air, uh, and he's known around him, he's probably safe enough. Yeah. But we all know that there are certain processes that do require more than one person. There's no getting away from it. Uh, you try and limit them, I suppose, in the first instance. Uh, but if there is a, something that does require that, you're introducing face masks and so on uh, to, to try and uh, alleviate the risk. Um, I think our, our RAMs have changed quite a bit uh, to contend with this. Sign-in processes have changed quite a bit as well, whereby uh, I suppose we use a, a system called Procore and we have a, every site now has a COVID-19 officer uh, appointed, one site management team. So when people are signing in on site, as opposed to the usual of getting the biro and everyone sharing the biro or going through turnstiles, uh, it's now verbally done. So he or she will be standing at the gate uh, the person who introduced themselves, they'll be able to, to see on the system, look, is this person inducted? Have they got their safe pass? Have they got all their relevant protocol? And then let them through. So we're trying to remove as much contact as is possible. Yeah. Um, I suppose outside of that, it's 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 a fair bit of cop on uh, is required. It won't be perfect. It won't be perfect in any sector, in any industry. Um, there'll always be issues arising. But we have been, you know, even speaking to our health and safety manager this morning, we've been really pleasantly surprised with the buy-in. Uh, from subcontractors. I mean, everyone is is making a great effort. I think every, because everyone's been off work for six weeks or so, everyone's chomping at the bit to get back at it. And they do realize that if they mess this up, uh, you could very quickly go back to pre-phase one again and everyone's locked at home. So, you know. Yeah, the the alternative to this doesn't look too pretty because we've, we've already doesn't. seen it. Yeah I, mean, yeah, I mean, how do you see it played out then, I sort of over in, in terms of the, um, the industry as a whole? I mean, how do you see this playing out over the next 18, 24 months or so? It's a, it's a funny one, I suppose. Look, we're quite good at uh, adopting. I mean, if you consider, if we were told at the start of the year, listen, lads, we're going to be shutting down the country uh, at the end of March and you're all going to be at home for six weeks, we would have cried and look, Undoubtedly, when, when Varadkar came on the news that Friday evening, we were all, I, I think, pretty taken aback. But we adapted and we got used to it pretty quickly. We got used to being at home, social distancing, the way you do your shopping, etc. Um, so I think we will get used to this new way of working. And the ultimate thing is we have to live with this virus for the next 18, 24 months, probably at least. Uh, we don't know. Um, so there's no point in shirking away or hiding or you know, we can't lock up the country indefinitely, so we have to adopt to it. And I think people by and large are doing that. And, you know, people are coming up with very novel ways of, of trying to go about their business uh, because they have to. If you don't come up with a solution, you're not going to reopen. So you have to come up with novel ways to, to fix it. Um, I think the, the, the industry on a whole, uh, it's, it's a bit tentative. I think uh, certainly there has to be continued public sector spending by the government. I think the worst possible thing that could happen is that the government say, right, COVID has cost us whatever, 25, 30 billion. Therefore, we need to reclaim that back. Uh, so we're going to introduce austerity, stop uh, capital spending. Um, because the private sector, I think, kind of runs a little bit in parallel with the public sector. Uh, they give each other confidence, you know, uh, and confidence is the key aspect here. So I think if the public sector capital spending continues, schools, uh, healthcare, roads, whatever else, I think the private sector will follow through. Um, the only interesting aspect of this, I think, is really the, the, the work from home side of things. Um, we have enormous commercial giants in Dublin, uh, you know, who have fed the economy for such a long time and created beautiful offices uh, from LinkedIn to Twitter and so on. Um, it'll be interesting to see if they maintain a long-term view of people working from home. Yeah, uh, that'll upset the market a little bit, but I think I don't know if they'll do that indefinitely. I suppose, and the thing about it is, as long as the the virus is with us, um, even if they have people working, I don't know, two days a week in the office or whatever it is, they're probably going to require more space per person anyway. So it might balance itself out. I don't know. Yeah, it, that that one's going to be interesting because I think what a lot of companies will have learned through this is that 
you know the need to, to have everyone in one place probably isn't as big as, as we thought and i think mm. we, we maybe have inherited a way of working that previous generations had, had taught us but you know this has taught us mm. well actually we have better technology and maybe there is a better way to work i think a lot of companies will certainly ourselves even we're a small construction to technology companies but we mm. we've adapted to this pretty easily you know but i'm sure yeah. there's other companies that, that that will as well we were yeah. keen to get you on mark because you've got a pretty impressive uh background in a, a subject that i'm very very passionate about and like myself i started off in my own business came out and went to the, as the, 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 the usual way the carpenter run the job said okay uh, this looks easy i'll just open up my own business because i'm basically running this job for this guy anyway so I, I, yeah. I, 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 this all looks easy and then you you get the harsh lesson and the harsh lesson for yeah. me was there's way more to, to running a construction company than just running the project Mm. I, I, I took a harsh lesson in, in, in the force business and we basically failed the force business because I didn't understand business development, I didn't understand strategy, I didn't understand marketing and branding and all of that and I took a bit of time out to go and understand all of that before I came back and had a second go, second go was much better. What in your opinion is the differences between marketing in construction say versus other industries? Uh, I suppose still in Ireland, anyway, for one, um, it's very much relationship based. Uh, I think, uh, well, for private sector work, certainly, uh, th there's anomalies and there, there, there are some issues there in, in terms of trying to gain access. For example, um, if you're a contractor, three, four, five years old, and say you have experience in building housing, trying to gain access into sectors such as education and healthcare, if you try and look at a suitability assessment questionnaire and uh, the minimum requirement is you have to have three projects of the similar uh, kind. You can't get in. So it, it, it's, it's one of those anomalies where you can't jump into an area and diversify because you don't have the experience. And, you know, you can't get the experience because you can't pre-qualify. So it's, uh, there are some issues like that. But I think uh, on the private sector side of things, it's very much relationship-based, which I quite enjoy, um, yeah. I must say. It's, uh, it's great if you have a lot of contacts and you're able to lean on them and gain business. Uh, I suppose it's somewhat more challenging in uh, new business development and trying to gain new relationships. Um, I think new relationships can only be gained out of doing really good work on your other projects and people advocating for you. Uh, it's, there's a lot of circles in construction. Uh, decision makers from consultants to clients to investors alike, they all talk to each other. Um, and I uh, you're, you're proven by performance really so that's number one in terms of gaining access to anywhere and then it's just uh, harnessing your relationships thereafter um, from a marketing point of view it's it's an interesting industry in that I suppose pre-recession marketing was so secondary uh, but in my view and, and not to sound remiss about it but I, I think strategy was somewhat secondary too um, like up until 07 you know you could fill your books relatively easily um, you could grow relatively easily, you could jump into most sectors relatively easily. Uh, and the recession hit and obviously, you know, uh, everything went away and people had to rethink their strategy. They realized, geez, suddenly we've, there's a lot of fish in this very small pond and marketing came to the fore. Mm -hmm. The companies, geez, we need a good website, uh, we need a good brochure, we need to present ourselves, our bids, our tenders need to present well because there's a lot of us fighting for very little work out there. And I think that was a very positive thing. It's, it's, it's interesting if you, I, I think now, for example, from a marketing perspective, I think there's many contracting companies that stand up as strong as, uh, you know, even business to consumer companies in terms of how they present to market themselves. They've yeah. uh, the, the, the introduction of, you know, uh, mission statements and brands and colors and hoardings you'll see, yeah. uh, from cranes to signage, you know, it's, it's at a different level. And there's a lot of competition in the marketing front now which is really healthy to see. It's great that we present ourselves um, in such a manner that it, it, it kind of it shows the good work you're doing internally. There's no it, point in... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's usually important in terms of... A lot of people look at branding, marketing in an aspect of this, this is what I need to do to win more customers. And I don't need that because I've got these relationships built and therefore mm. I don't need to invest all that money in, into that. So I've, I've got a great black book that's done me up to this point. But what people don't realize yeah. the other side of branding and marketing is attracting and maintaining good staff. It's also attached to this strategy. I.e., what you say, these when these guys are putting their, their brand and their brand values in front of people where you've got mm. a shortage of skills in the industry and you've got people now that are in a position where they can make a decision who they work for, I think this pays off. Um, it does in a big way. 
Yeah, I, I really um, do. You, you, you touched on one thing there, Mark, that I just wouldn't mind bringing up. I mean, a lot of guys in the conversation talk about the tender and the bid process, and it's, you know, I, I'm in a tender process, therefore, what, you know, why, why do I need marketing? I, I understand how, how to put a bid together. I mean, how can marketing strategies be applied to that sort of bid process? Well, to a bid process, I suppose, again, uh, bids in terms of their appearance and submission have changed an awful lot from pre-recession to now as well. So you would have seen the introduction uh, of a much better marketed material uh, post, or well, I won't say post-recession, since the start of the recession, I should say. Uh, pre-recession, up to 07, you could very often just bang in your former tender and general summary and away you go. There was no questions asked. Um, I think a lot of procurement officers and PQSs and PMs now are looking a lot deeper and they're wanting to see what your company is about. Um, you know, you, you can't just jump in and go for it. So I think that's I think that's a positive thing. I would have seen a, a massive shift change in, in 2008 in terms of how bids are presented. And uh, they're now really, really proper marketing documents. They're, they're a brochure of your company and they're putting your best foot forward. Um, I suppose, look, you, you would have seen the introduction, speaking from a, a technical perspective, the, the likes of InDesign, Photoshop, uh, a lot more software is to create proper uh, material to go out there. Um, but, but like the, the, the marketing and business development side of things go hand in hand in that regard. The, 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 the instance about bids, I suppose, uh, and it's something I've worked, I suppose, in for 12, 13 years now. Um, it's timing, it's delegation, um, it's, I suppose, quality over quantity. We would have had a habit in this industry of drawing up a 100-page document and you kind of throw it at it. There's your Bible. Your answer is in there. But if you're making it hard for the person procuring to find what they're looking for, you're on the back foot straight away. So if you're in receipt of PQS, for example, and it's a 20 million euro apartment building, and you're in, in receipt of a very nicely presented document, it sets a tone immediately. You go, geez, these guys look professional. And you can, you, can, you can punch above your weight in that regard, you know, even for smaller contractors. But then it's about, I suppose, drawing up your bid exactly as per the requirements. So you make it really easy to read, really easy to mark. It's no different to, you know, uh, I suppose, uh, an exam in school or whatever. You just make it easy for the reader and you will gain marks better. And then it's quality over quantity as well. Don't just throw the Bible at every part of the thing because you have it handy and you don't put the effort in. Read the stuff and just two pages of quality will definitely be much better than you know 20 pages of generic stuff all day every day you know yeah th th there's a couple of things you, you touched on there actually which are interesting uh, you're obviously saying you 12 13 years experience there putting these bits together if you were to summarize three three of them points that you touched on there three top tips let's say for a successful bid what would what would they be uh i suppose look there's a few things so if i if i if i had to look at it uh from start to finish being in receipt of your bid, I suppose the first thing, the first top tip is review it at the earliest opportunity. I think we all have a habit of, and look, there's there's still times where you kind of, particularly if you're busy, you might receive a, a tender in and you've got five, six weeks to return it. And it kind of gets put over there because look, I have this much on my desk and I need to get at this before I even look at it. That's probably the worst thing you can do because if you do that, you're just going immediately on the back foot and you're putting yourself under pressure. So I would say, Reviewing it straight away from the front end, I usually do a, a kind of a tender launch summary whereby I review the requirements. Uh, second top tip is, is delegate early. So typically for a bid, you'd have from an estimator, perhaps project manager, planner, etc. Delegate out what their requirements are and give them deadlines at the earliest opportunity because that way you're giving them time. Uh, and then the third thing, uh, I suppose, a, a top tip, which a lot of people don't do, and I think it's, you know, we're all a little prone to it is, reviewing your submission. I mean, it would be easy if you have 10 different elements just to grab them from the various stakeholders, bang it together and put it through. But actually re reading through it thereafter and making sure that it's correct, it's accurate, right. Um, you know, you can't, you shouldn't just presume that all the stakeholders are going to write it in the correct manner, answer the question, whatever. You have to go through it and you have to go through it in detail and you have to be articulate and review it as if you're marking it yourself, you know, and that way you're, you're challenging yourself throughout. There are probably three key elements. Other than that, presentation is, is, is critical as well. You know, if you present a, a really nicely put together bid, nicely bound, um, it sets it sets the impression straight away with the reader. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, if you're set with a positive impression as as the person market from the front end, 
you do tend to lean more so on the positive side of your market. Um, whereas if it looks crap, you tend to market poorly as well. That's just huge. Yeah, no, that's absolutely spot on. I mean, you've you've also got, I mean, obviously the town more currently are active in, in the UK, but you've also got experience in the Middle East, I suppose. What's different then between the bidding and procurement process here versus, say, UK and Middle East? Uh, well, you know, I suppose across the UK and Europe, it's it's not enormously different because, you know, we all follow European guidelines to a point. Uh, some of the challenges, like in mainland Europe, would certainly have been uh, language barriers. Um, but by and large, most multinationals, if that's who you're working with, work in English anyway, because they're usually uh, born over the UK or over the US. Uh, the UK is a good market to work in, in my view. I, I like the fact that uh, it's traditional. It's a, it's a funny one. They, they often like to see the fact that you have you know proper overheads, proper profit in your jobs, as opposed to in Ireland, there's still sometimes a tendency to cut the, the price for the sake of cutting the price, you know, to get the job at all costs. But they'll challenge you a little bit more over in the UK in terms of, uh, I suppose, the way you, you, you price it to ensure that you actually have built in a price you can live up to and that you can deliver on. Um, the Middle East is an anomaly, to be honest with you. The Middle East is un, uh, not, not just from a bidding perspective, but uh, from carrying out work perspective, it's it's unlike anywhere else. And I think anyone who, who, who has uh, carried out work there will, will advise of that. Um, I suppose the first company I was uh, working with, uh, we would have done work across the Emirates uh, from you know Dubai to Abu Dhabi and so on. And uh, it's it's I suppose you need a sponsor there locally to back you, but the way business is carried out there, it's it's unlike anywhere else. Uh, so I suppose if you are going to try and uh, branch into new markets, you have to understand the way they conduct business. You won't go too far wrong in Europe, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, but having local people on the ground is, is a good help. Look, Enterprise Ireland can be helpful in gaining access to certain markets too. Uh, they would have helped us out uh, at, at times. Um, but I, I think understanding the market, and if you're really going to be bold and, and try and go into a, a market such as the Middle East or that, or Northern Africa, for example, you really need to do your homework before you get in there because uh, things can go very awry very quickly unless you're informed, shall we say. I mean, you, you, you're touching on on the UK there. It looks like we're going to face an inevitable recession here, meaning so as many companies are going to start looking at the UK, probably even for yeah. the same as they did in the yeah. last recession. How does a company evaluate a new construction market? And I suppose, how do you decide where you should go? Yeah, well, I suppose, again, this is another learning from the recession the last time. And I think people have learned that you have to balance out the sectors you work in you have to balance out a bit of private and a bit of public because either one can fall at any time. And uh, what you just alluded to there, you, you perhaps have to balance out the geography so that, you know, if Ireland goes downward, that you perhaps have another market that you can lend your resources into or put more weight on for a period to, to get things going again. Um, for the UK, for us, I suppose, uh, I'd be speaking out of turn because we've been working in London. I'm with the company four or five years, but they're working in London there 10 or 12 years. So the guys understand that market. London's a great market in terms of, um, it's another anomaly to use that turn of phrase again, because London is a, an economy of its own, even within the UK. Yeah. Uh, always operate, uh, it'll always keep busy, keep ticking over. You'll even have seen throughout the last recession, there were still plenty of cranes up. Uh, for a lot of people, London's the center of the world uh, for Middle Eastern people and so on, more, more so than New York and so on. So there'll always be inward investment there, I think. Um, but in terms of establishing a market, you have to first of all understand what's your reason for access. Why are you doing it? Like, um, yeah. you've got to establish: is there a market there? I mean, certainly a company I worked for before who would do a lot of data centres across Europe. The, the the key reason they jumped into countries across Europe was was frankly because uh, there was no one else providing the service that they were offering. So, in general contracting, it's more challenging because I suppose. Most com countries have general contractors there who are probably going to perform the same thing as you. But if you're getting into more specialist space, or say, I suppose a good example would be uh, John Fleming going to London uh, and doing uh, Vision Build over there, which he's made amazing success out of. Um, and he has, you know, he's now building the largest modular building in the world in London. And you know, Fleming obviously would have struggled massively here in the recession. Mm -hmm. So he. Opening, he saw a market, he saw something that nobody else was doing, or certainly nobody else was doing it his way, 
and he got access and he got resources on the ground. And, you know, thankfully, he's, he's keeping a lot of uh, consultants over in Ireland busy uh, with the work he's doing over there. So that's the good thing about, um, I suppose, working internationally is you can still rely and fall back on your Irish staff to do a lot of yeah. the donkey, a lot of the heavy yeah. lifting. We, we do seem to, seem to travel well. I mean, I, I spent nine years away and I was always amazed mm. when I hit the big projects across uh, mm. Sydney, Perth, that when you, when you got into senior management, level that the there was an irish <laughs> representative nearly everywhere you went you know whether that's yeah. project management site management we do travel well our skills seem to travel well so i mean we shouldn't have any fear about going into these markets mm-hmm. some will probably question whether they're big enough um mm-hmm. suppose what in your experience then what experience should you have at, at senior management in your own team before you even attempt to go and look abroad I think it's great to have people like the, I suppose one good thing on the back of the recession was so many of our people travelled and got that international experience. You did in Australia, loads of our guys went to the Middle East, the UK, some even to the States. And a lot of them have come back, they've brought that experience with them. So we can say in our in our company alone, like our managing director uh, spent time working in the UK, North Africa, the Middle East. Uh, regional director here in the east spent a good bit of time in the middle east as well so they're bringing that experience back with them it's more challenging say if you're a small business perhaps you know much further down the food chain um but i think it would be possibly silly of them to jump into an international market uh too quickly um i think the skill sets within the company you have to be very strategic you have to have good financial acumen within the company as well and commercial acumen understand the contracts understand the implications of not fulfilling your contracts is a huge part of it particularly in 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 places like the middle east and that um but like i i think for any business in ireland uh, construction business or otherwise uh, small medium or large i think jumping into the uk isn't such a big deal i know companies that turn over three and four million who have uh, performed jobs in, in london for example successfully uh, it might be a one-off job as a client drive them across and there was no issue. Uh, we understand the UK very, very well. There's no issues jumping in there. Uh, there's a few language barriers in the likes of France, Denmark, uh, Switzerland, and so on. But by and large, most of the Irish companies that are working over there are working in specialized areas such as pharmaceutical uh, data centers and so on. I don't know if there's a market for a general contractor just to jump into countries like that. There probably isn't. These are well-established markets themselves, even more so than ours. So I think, look, if you, if you have a management team who have good financial acumen, good contractual understanding, uh, you need good legal representatives to make sure that you're not jumping into something you're unaware of, um, and then go into a specialised area, um, I think you're, you could be on the winner very quickly. Like we, do, we do travel very well as a nation. No yeah, doubt about that. I 100% would, would agree with that and have my, my experience of that was very positive. It was actually, mm. it always surprised me. It's just something that's always struck me when, when, when working on these projects across mm. Australia was just that the Irish impact on these jobs was absolutely huge from senior management right down into the trades. Um, yeah. I mean, for those that don't see international markets as an option, where do you see opportunities for growth within our own Irish construction um, industry? I, I would think, you know, it's a funny thing. Uh, I suppose from, from, from 08 probably to 2012 or 13, there was a lot of companies had fallen back into public sector contracts. It was probably one of the only games in town, frankly. There wasn't a lot of private work out there. Uh, there would have been some degree in fit out and so on. But they fell back into public contracts and their strategy probably from 2012, 13 was increase the size or quantity of private work on your books. So it's less than that public sector work. It's, it's, you know, the margins are too tight, it's too challenging, the contracts are heartbreaking, et cetera. But on the, on the, it's amazing how quickly things change. I think at the moment, uh, any contractors who have public sector work on are probably pleased to have it on because they feel a job will happen. They'll get paid. Uh, they're, they're, there's hope there. And I think uh, people are, are really looking at themselves again and going, geez, it's very important to keep that balance of public and private work. Uh, so I think... For the next 12, 24 months, I think certain sectors such as hospitality are going to fall off quite a bit, uh, which is unfortunate, I suppose. Look, we, we have a lot of hotel experience. We've done four hotels in Dublin. We're, we have another one on in Cork at the moment, and we have another one due to start there in Dublin 1. But, you know, those people are suffering more than any other. I think hospitality has got the biggest blow here. So I think that's going to fall off, and that's been a real, uh, you know, stronghold for many companies for the last couple of years. 
In terms of resi, it's an interesting one. Social housing has to and will progress. Um, you know, that problem hasn't gone away. Um, but in terms of private resi, I think, and I'd imagine a lot of private investors uh, and funds who back these, you know, it's one thing being a front, but ultimately you need to get the, the sign off from the fund who's backing you to build. Uh, I think they're quite tentative at the moment. I think certain ones in the right locations where, you know, uh, the, the site was probably got at an appropriate cost and so on will drive on. But I think some more speculative ones will hold back a little bit now. Perhaps be a little bit tentative and kind of go, right, let's see how this plays out a little bit, which you'd expect. So the areas, I suppose, if I'm strategizing, I'm thinking, right, public works, strong enough, healthcare, education, uh, and so on, they'll, they'll go on well. I'm thinking probably the control environment side of things for our business in a way, from medical device and so on, they're busy. They've upped the ante this past while. Uh, a lot of our clients in that field, they make things from inhalers to masks and so on, so you can imagine how busy they are. Yeah. That's a good space. Um, and outside of that, I suppose, on the private side of things, as we said, hospitality has dropped off. There's still some resi going. Commercial office, speaking to peers in the industry, they're saying there's still a lot of opportunity and there's still a lot of positivity out there, So, which is which is great to hear. Um, I suppose we've jumped into this COVID thing in, in, in very good stead financially as, a, as an economy. Um, and it was dramatic what happened to all of us uh, and how the, the stop was there. I think if the government does an equally dramatic response uh, in terms of uh, helicopter uh, some money in to the appropriate SMEs and get things going, get things fluid, which they have access to through, through the ECB now with the 750 billion euro fund. I think if they, if they make the right financial decisions, we can get back moving again relatively quickly. So, I, you know, it's it, it's all in confidence, to answer to hear on. If there's yeah. confidence, there, and we need to instill confidence in people and say, it's okay, we can get back at it now where we have things under control. Uh, if we incite fear in people, things will, will, will drop off dramatically, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I think sector-wise, I think public sector works, and I think certain areas in private sector, such as... Uh, pharma, medical device, and so on, will, will proceed as planned. Um, and some resi jobs will proceed as planned. Commercial office seems to be buoyant, which is good. I can see hospitality just dropping off dramatically. That's the one that's going to be hit most, you know, unfortunately. A lot of food for thought for, for business owners and operators out there is, you know, this mm. the F and E being, the rug is being pulled from us, there's no doubt. And it's, it's, mm. it's, it's, it's the line in the sand thing where, okay, that was then, what's now? Or what, what, how are we going to approach this? No one really knows how it's going to play out. Uh, yeah. We all have our opinions and how we think it's going to see and going by past experiences it is always good. You've given us some great mm. stuff in there, Mark, actually around things to look out for in, in terms of UK and especially around them bids. Um, you're working for a very interesting company. If people do want to know more about Telmore or even find out a bit about yourself, where can they find you? Uh, well, for Telmore, they can go to just uh, telmore.ie. That's T-O-W-N-M-O-R-E dot uh, Or look, we, we, we've been working on our LinkedIn page, I suppose, uh, for this past while. So there's about 4,500 followers there. So we update that quite regularly. Uh, and then if you want to find out about more about me, you're, you probably need to question what you're doing with your life. <laughs> I wish it was more exciting, Kieran. I'm not that exciting. You, know? you can ask my wife. She, yeah. She'll give you the honest answer. <laughs> Bids win, win, win work, Mark, and that's been highly valuable in terms of the, the advice and, and tips and stuff you've given around there. It's, it really is good. Your, your forward thinking around marketing and the, the, the alignment from marketing to bids is... is uh, impressive and I'm a, I'm a huge fan of it uh, Mark thank you very much for coming on I wish you all thank the you. best with, with, with this uh, sticky time but I'm absolutely no, no doubt you're going to come flying through it so thanks very ah, much yeah. for coming on no worries thank you and look uh, you know if I could if I could say anything I just think people you know let's keep confident and, and keep pushing um, you know we, we, we can talk ourselves into a problem or a recession here very quickly if we keep confident keep talking ourselves up I think uh, you know we we we'll get we we'll get the hang of this pretty quickly and we'll get through it. You know, so that's that's important. Yeah, fully agree. All right, thanks, Mark. Appreciate it.